Um, all right, here is a great for Chicago, and I know you guys will be quiet and focused for my next guest because we're going to talk Chicago now. It was fun to talk New York for a second, but let's talk Chicago. Uh, the former Commerce Secretary, the White House Chief of Staff under Obama, the heads of several, I mean, several banks in his career, uh, a former mayoral and gubernatorial candidate, one of the members of the Royal Family of Chicago. Give it up for Mr. Bill Daly. Yes. Mr. Chicago, good to yeah, see you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. If you're not from Chicago, welcome. Our weather is like this all year round. So, uh, uh, how, are, how are you enjoying the uh, Democratic National Convention? It's great. I mean, the first day was spectacular. Uh, the city looks great because it is great. And people are enjoying themselves, and people feel good about what we're trying to accomplish here, and that is get a presidential candidate that has a good chance of changing America. The last time there was a Democratic National Convention in Chicago was 1996. Yep. Uh, you and your brother, who was the mayor at the time, were a big part of bringing it here. And, and do you remember those days? I mean, what sure. Can you, what can you yep. say about that versus what's happening today in 2024? You know, there's a lot of similarities, to be frank with you. The city was in good shape. Uh, our politics was good. Uh, we, have a, we have a strong governor in Illinois, for those of you who don't know it, who has really done a great job. People, f we want to showcase Chicago. The world comes to these conventions, and uh, with the excitement, political excitement around it, that just adds to the attention. So I think people are really feeling good. We're showing the best of Chicago, and at the same time, it's a serious convention about nominating someone that's going to change America. You wanted to be mayor, and, and you know very yeah, well, I'm sure, yeah, from no, Sunday no. night dinners and things like that about what, what it takes to be a mayor. I mean, things can go right. Obviously, you're seeing a, a tremendous crowd here, and Chicago looks amazing. But there's also infrastructure issues. You've got uh, things going on, on on how you actually make the city still work when you have a convention like that. I mean, right. as someone who has been in, in leadership positions, that's things that, that, that is a risk to, for a city to take on a oh, convention like this. Let me just tell you, first of all, there aren't many cities that can handle a convention this size. And they're getting fewer and fewer. We have tremendous hotels in a central area. You don't have to go miles. Some cities I've been to for conventions, delegations are saying 30 miles away. It's, it's logistically very difficult. Obviously, in a big city, the city, the normal life of the city has got to go on while these big events are happening. So if you have to balance the two, make sure that the citizens in Chicago, of Chicago have the police protection, fire protection, all the services that they need. At the same time, you have an enormous strain on all those, all those things because of the security needs and the emergency needs and just making sure that the transportation needs of the delegates and the thousands of people are here get satisfied. At the same time, the people of Chicago who live here, pay the taxes, go to work, that they're not uh, disadvantaged in any way. Tough challenge. It's a tough challenge. Uh, tonight's a big night for you uh, because tonight your former boss is taking the stage at the Democratic National Convention, uh, Barack Obama. And uh, talk about the reunion because all of the Obama team is in town. We saw Valerie Jarrett was here a little bit earlier. Right. Uh, David Plouffe was here. There's others that are a part of it. What does it mean for you to, to come together with a crew that you well, ran with uh, a couple years back? I, I have the pleasure of also having been part of the Clinton administration. Yesterday we had a reunion 700 people who worked in the Clinton administration with the president, former president, and Secretary uh, Hillary Clinton. So it was great. It's great. The one great advantage of the, having been to so many conventions, uh, you see a lot of people you don't know, see you know year round, and so every four years. People who you haven't seen in four or 12 or eight or 12 years come together, and it's great. And, and the, both the Obama alumni and the Clinton alumni they have stayed engaged in service to the public, stayed engaged in politics. Um, and the Obama Center here in Chicago, when it's finished, will be about creating the next generation of leaders and people who view public service as important to their communities. You know, it's an easy question here in Chicago, but what made uh, President Obama special? You know, he, he caught a moment in history, let's be honest, and he said it. There was nothing about him that one would think he should be President of the United States. Okay? We had never seen anything like that. African-American man, somebody who had just gotten in the Senate for about a year and a half. But I think he touched the chord 
in 04 when he gave that speech in Boston, for any of you who were there or saw it, that people said, this guy is different, this guy is special. He had the ability to touch people and make them feel, as he said, to be hopeful about the future of America. So, so he, uh, he was fun to work with. He, was, he is a really good guy, uh, extremely smart, gets, has a sense of America, the good and bad of America, and the challenges and the opportunities. Um, and, and so he, he's kind of a special guy. Yeah, and a good basketball uh, player, too, right? He was okay. <laughs> Did you ever play basketball with no. him? You, you don't well, get a short guy like me, are you kidding me? <laughs> uh, no, it's not my sport. Mike Allen from Axios once wrote about you, said you're the most connected Democrat in America. And I think in Chicago, people know you and know your family, especially from the elected yeah. office and, and, and you know, serving in Chicago government. But they don't necessarily think of the dailies as someone who's connected nationwide. What does it take to be called... Is, first of all, do you find it accurate? And what does it take to be called the most connected Democrat in America? I don't know, hang around a long time, maybe. Um, no, I've had the opportunity being back many years ago. I kind of focus around national and political or presidential politics, even when my dad was in power. You know, I, Hubert Humphrey, Jack Kennedy, I mean, I, I, we were around uh, all of them. And then I, I traveled with Walter Mondale in 1984 on his plane for three and a half months against Ronald Reagan. So I've stayed involved in national politics and that's given me an opportunity to meet people, have, have relationships around the country. I, I've also worked for uh, uh, very large US companies. I was with JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, SBC down in Texas. So on the business side, I have great relationships over the years. So it, I've been very fortunate, um, and it's given me an opportunity to see parts of America and be part of politics and business. That's pretty uh, amazing. The last thirty years. I was going to say, in you know, one second. Let, I think some new people came in. Hey guys, keep it down in the back just a little bit, okay? Everybody back by the free food. <laughs> Go ahead and just just let us talk for just a second. All right, um, but you know they say that. There's something special. You see this in Los Angeles with, with television in Hollywood. A lot of uh, Chicago people get jobs. They're connected. Once you say you're from Chicago, they want those people to be the producers, the directors, whatever it is. In politics, is it similar? Is there a Chicago ethic, a work ethic, that, that makes you different than somebody else who might be in politics? I think the history of Chicago and around politics. Obviously, the system has changed uh, tremendously over the years. But politics has been, has been a contact sport in Chicago, and oftentimes our contact, our real contact sports, football is, doesn't do so well. So uh, politics is sort of the, next to the sports teams, when they're bad, everybody goes to politics. And it's usually pretty entertaining and very contact driven. So, so that's been the history of Chicago. You, you've had that ingrained in this city. And, and, and when you look at the makeup of the city over the years, all the immigrants who came to Chicago with all the diversity that they created and them all trying to get into politics in different ways. That's a history in many big old cities. But Chicago kept that politics. We kept our, some people called it the machine, my father called it the organization, kept that together much longer than most other cities who had that, but it, it died out a lot earlier than it did here. You know, for you, you mentioned your dad, uh, and you know, obviously, we're going to bring up the 1968 convention. Yeah. As a young man, what what were your thoughts at that time when that was happening, or what are your memories now? Is it positive, negative around your dad, the his his legacy, and what happened at the 1968 you know, my convention? My dad was mayor for 21 years. He got elected six times. He got elected. Um, uh, two times after 68. So the national view that this was a terrible thing for him, people in Chicago weren't quite as negative on him as some, some people. people some thought. people, yeah, right. Yeah, but, but when you win twice by like 65 or 70 percent of the vote, I would say that's pretty good. I didn't have that opportunity. The one thing I talk, I say always about 1968, and to look back, especially people who weren't alive then, it was one of the most tumultuous, volatile years in the history of America. You had a 
500,000 young Americans sitting in Vietnam. Most people had no idea where Vietnam was. You had a president who got chased out of office. You had Martin Luther King assassinated, and then all the riots after that. You then had Bobby Kennedy assassinated. You went to Miami for the Republican convention. Six people were killed in the riots associated with that convention. You then had in Paris youth riots. You had the Russians invade Czechoslovakia in July, and nobody did a thing. And that all rolled to Chicago. Okay, so the country boiled over in Chicago from all, and, and, and before even 68, the change with civil rights and the cultural changes that were going on. So you can't look at that brief three days or the one day at Balboa in Michigan and think that that's the story of what was going on in America then. It wasn't. And, and again, it's the, the clips of that are terrible. Nobody liked what happened there. Everybody kind of played their part. There were people who came with legitimate reasons to, to disagree with the war. I will say this. Had Bobby Kennedy survived, what happened in Chicago would never have happened because he would have been the nominee of the party. And just as I think here, the demonstrations that everybody was predicting were going to happen, the air went out of bloom when Kamala Harris became the uh, nominee. Why do you think that is? Why, why do you think that? I mean, because they'll say that, that there's still a movement. Well, there's a movement, but you're not, I don't, at least I haven't seen, maybe others have 100,000 people walking down the street, which was predicted a while ago. I think it's changed. There's an opportunity for something different. Again, if Robert Kennedy had been nominated, he was clearly saying he was going to end the war, and people would have said, okay, let's give him a chance. I think in a lot of the problems that we have in America right now, now that uh, Vice President Harris will be the nominee and the potential president, she's saying, give me a chance to address these issues. Let's, and, let, let's talk about yeah. uh, the Vice President. Uh, as, as someone who has raised money for the party, who has been a chief of staff in the White House, what is Kamala Harris have to do? He's going to get a bump from this great convention and everything that's happening in Chicago. But from your vantage point, what does Kamala Harris have to do to secure uh, the, the White House in November? What, what's the path forward for the Democrat nominee? Okay. First, she is the underdog. I mean, anybody, all this excitement, it's all great and everybody has fun and we're all excited. But she's the underdog. The Republican nominee will start with an electoral base that's bigger than ours. So we're always fighting over the five, six states. Now she has the potential to put a few other states on the table for Democrats, for her, for her to maybe win, uh, that, what, that weren't there two months ago. She's got to, I think she, what she has to do, and the positive and negative of a short campaign, the positive is you, you don't have a lot of time, and once you catch a wave like she's on now, you may be able to keep it going for a while. But I think on like on Thursday, She's got to tell people, and even though she's been vice president, and even though she was a senator, nobody really knows these people, okay? She's got to introduce who she is, and what are, what are her values? How does she make a decision? How does she view life? It's not, here's my 10-point plan, and you know, people say, oh, I don't like one, but I like two. That's BS. It's, it's who is this person? How do they view things? Barack Obama came, President Obama came through unbelievably in 08, and people thought, this guy is different, I get it, and he, he thinks through these issues. Not, not everyone agreed with all his positions, obviously, but, he, but there was a, there, he was able to convey sort of who he was and how he would govern. And that's, as, that's the best you, almost you can do, because we're so divided, you're not gonna say, okay, here's my position on immigration, and that's gonna satisfy everyone or even on Gaza, or on Ukraine, you know? And so I think she's got to begin in a very strong way Thursday night to tell people who she is. And, and that's, a, that's a big challenge, but if she gets it right, she then rolls into a debate, if Trump will debate her. I don't think the, tr President Trump will want to debate her early because if she did well at a debate with him early in September, she could maybe be like a horse to a barn and just say, I'm running to the barn and the hell with everything else. They're, they're debating about the debate now. Yep. <laughs> so we can't just have a debate. We have to have a debate about a debate now. Um, you know, I want to switch to Chicago. For, and first, ask you about your brother. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously the 96 convention is Mayor Richard M. Daley's convention. Uh, he's retired. He's out of out of politics. How's he doing? Uh, and, you know, he's keeping a pretty low profile. A lot of retired mayors would be up, they'd have their, you know, they'd be, they'd be renting one of these pontoon boats <laughs> to let them know they're in town. You know, uh, what's he doing? He's doing great. His health is good. Um, I talk to him every day. He's, he's, he's just, he's in good shape. But he, he has been very intentional for now 13 years in just, he knows what it is when people are yapping at you and you, and you don't appreciate appreciate the difficulty of a mayor's job. So he's kept a very low profile, and he's going to maintain that. You know, he's, um, he's been good, and we talk politics all the time, and, and, um, but he's around town, and you, you may see him. He won't do any interviews. He's not going to come here to Axios. So oh, all due respect to Axios. <laughs> it would be great. Could you imagine you and Richie right next to each other? Like, that'd be great. Uh, right? <laughs> nah, you may think so. I don't know about Bring that. it back. Next time you have the dinner table convo, just bring it up. Okay. There's an idea for yeah, the I'll next time. Just have a video though. there. We yeah, can that's right. Watch us um, argue. The, the city of Chicago now, 2024, uh, different mayor, Mayor Brandon Johnson. Uh, your thoughts on Brandon Johnson, and what advice would you give the mayor? Uh, that's not the no, 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 I, I, look at look at I, I know why is it a groaner? Thanks, that's a, you, uh, yeah, that's true. I'm not okay. Okay, that may have been it. Um, first of all, it's the toughest job in America to be a mayor of a city. He comes from a very different background. He had not been in politics, real politics, never held elective office. It, very brief with the county board, which is. Not really. Uh, a Watch out, uh, that's John's uh, spot. Yeah, my brother yeah. John's on that. <laughs> but, but it is a legislative spot, but not really a legislative spot. So, so his background is very different. So now he runs a $15 billion company with 60,000 employees. Very big challenge to manage that. And when you've not experienced the management of things of any size or been part of something that really was big, it's hard. And he's not spent... 25 years, 30 years, in coming through the system of Chicago, so that when he took over as mayor, people would say, "Okay, we get how he, is, what he's about." And his politics, quite frankly, and he is very progressive. And the city, and, and he, he got 51 percent of a 35 percent turnout, so that's 17 percent of eligible voters voted for him. That's not exactly a mandate for change, and that's a challenge for a mayor. It, it, and I think a lot of politicians. Not, not, I'm not just I'm not speaking about the mayor here. Win and think no matter how, what percent they win, they've got some mandate for fundamental change. And the truth of the matter is, life is a, about incremental change. You know, we all say we love change, but we really don't. Whether it's in your personal or your business life, you really don't like change. But we all say we do. And some people who go out for fundamental change you got to understand, in my opinion, people don't change, they don't, you don't like to totally change who you are, most and And so you've got to understand, especially when you run a city that's so diverse in all ways, that you've got to build coalitions. And that's hard to do when you've not been in that game. And you've only been, the, to be fair, only been the mayor for... Two years or a year at this point too, so there's still time to go uh, in the first term as well. Yeah, but but usually your best days are like the first two days. <laughs> I, I was giving you an out. Okay. I was no, giving you an out, Bill. It, it, it gets more difficult. It does not get easier. <laughs> it does not get easier. It gets harder. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. The honeymoon is. You know, it's over. It's over. All right, in our last minute, the most pivotal question for, for a kid from Bridgeport. Should Reinstorf sell the White Sox? I like Jerry Reinstorf, but one way or the other, uh, something's going to happen that he's going to sell it. He's not going to own it. Right. He may not sell it. Maybe his heirs sell it. That's going to happen. But I don't really care about new stadiums. How about a new team? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I mean, really? There's Does your anybody quote. go to look at the the stadium or the food's good? But come on, you go to watch the uh, the team. The team. Uh. I mean, if the team's not any good. 
We went out, my kids went out the other night to watch the Yankees. Really, to watch the Yankees, not the White Sox. That's a terrible thing to say. Because <laughs> oh. we've had a box at, at Sox Park. And I've got a great picture of, in 1959, my dad was mayor and the Sox were in the World Series. And there's a picture of the box we used to have uh, on the field. And it was my dad, Jack Kennedy, Rich, and the baseball commissioner was a guy named Happy Chandler, who was a United States senator from Kentucky who quit to be the baseball commissioner. That's how important he thought the Senate was. Um, but it's a famous picture. So we've had a box there for 60 years. And Bill Veck, one of the owners, said Mayor Daley was the only politician who paid for his tickets. <laughs> Bill Daly, thank you so much for coming to Axios House. Appreciate the conversation. Thank you, man.